I'm so happy that you're here today because we are going to dive even deeper into language sampling prescores with autism spectrum disorder. So today we are going to look at Marge Block's natural language acquisition approach and how she uses that to analyze language samples for prescores with autism spectrum disorder. Why are we looking at this approach? We're looking at this approach because this approach is currently popular on social media. So that means that the likelihood is that you're going to be working with another professional if you're not using this approach yourself. And it's really important that we're all able to communicate with one another. So if you work with children with autism spectrum disorder, odds are you're not just working with that child, you're working with that child's team. So it's really important that we're able to communicate with each other. And therapists that are using this approach, the natural language acquisition approach, are deriving their goals using this approach and their intervention approach using this approach and their evaluation. So for us to be able to communicate with one another, we're going to have to know these six stages. We're going to cover these six stages today, and this should give you the information you need so that you are able to collaborate and communicate effectively with other interventionists that may be using this approach. Before we go into this approach, I want you to know where I am coming from. I am Kelly Vess. I read tons of research. I read so many books, it's ridiculous. And I have hundreds and hundreds of hours of continuing education coursework. What I want you to know is that I have never advocated or rejected a single evidence-based approach. And it's no different in this situation. Today, I am not advocating Marge Blank's natural language, language acquisition approach. As any other approach that I've studied and I've researched, every approach has its strengths and it has its weaknesses. You cannot take an approach as is, as a total package, because it has a lot of every approach I've seen, ineffective strategies in it, and it has a lot of um, even non-evidence-based strategies in it. So you have to buyer beware. You have to be a very intelligent consumer when it comes to intervention approaches. I promise you there is not one approach out there today that does not contain ineffective, ineffective strategies with it. If it does in it within it, I want you to come and challenge me. I want to look through it with you, but I promise you I'll find some. So I am in no way advocating this approach today, and I am no way rejecting this approach because every single approach has strengths and weaknesses. When it comes to intervention approaches, you and I, we're in this really unique era in which we have access to every evidence-based approach at our fingertips in this information age. What we need to do is we have to be able to discern. We have to be able to discern the good from the bad. And we have to be able to take the good and combine the good and create better. So what I'm going to tell you today is my advice when it comes to intervention approaches is to approach it with this, the best advice that I've ever been given, I've ever read from the Bhagavad Vita, and that is live life like a swan, swallow the nutrients and expel the dirt. So I live that motto in my life and how I approach intervention as a speech pathologist. There is a lot of nutrients that you can gain from each of these intervention approaches out there. And there's a lot of dirt in them as well. And you have to be very discerning. And what's gonna happen is you're going to take the nutrients from all of these disparate very different approaches from very different disciplines, and you're going to pull them together, particularly in working with children with autism spectrum disorder, because it's a multifaceted disorder. It needs a multifaceted approach. So you are going to be grabbing best practices from different disciplines. 
and you're going to combine those practices. And by doing so, you're going to have a more potent intervention that will produce greater gains, that's going to create greater change, that's going to change these children's lives. And that's because we're going to follow what the Bhagavad Vita says, and that is we're going to swallow the nutrients, nutrients. we're going to expel the dirt, and we're going to make the world a better place one child at a time. You and I are in a unique position that no one else has had in history, in which literally at your fingertips, you have access to multiple disciplines, to the best approaches out there. And from those disciplines, you can take the most potent active ingredients and combine them. And there will be a cumulative effect in which you are going to really create real change when neuroplasticity is at its highest level. I know that I kind of got a little bit off topic here, but it's a really important topic. And that topic is this, you have to be discerning. Do not jump on a bandwagon. It's hard in these social media days where people are jumping on approach bandwagons and being like, this approach is horrible and this one is wonderful. And all of this black and white thinking, that's not going to get us anywhere. What's going to propel us forward is by being discerning and real recognizing the strengths in every single approach and recognizing the weaknesses in every single approach. This is crucially important to your effectiveness with every child on your caseload. Okay, so we're going to get into the natural language acquisition approach, that said. And I want to look at the six stages of that approach. Now, when we look at these six stages, I'm going to give an example that we can all relate to. So when you're giving a standardized speech assessment, you show the child a picture and you turn the page and the child labels the picture. Easy peasy. So that's a context we can all relate to. So let's pretend that I am providing a speech sound disorder test, simple easel test with pictures to a child. And we're going to use that situation and what kind of language would be produced at each of the stages, okay? So I'm giving a standardized speech test to a child. The first stage, stage one of natural language acquisition is the echolalia stage. Now in that stage, the child is simply producing a gestalt. A gestalt is a memorized piece, uh, chunk of language, okay, chunk of words. So I'm showing the child my ease on my book and the child says in a high pitched tone, turn it to the next page, turn it to the next page. Each time I turn the page, turn it to the next page. That is stage, stage one, that is echolalia. Now let's look at stage two. Stage two is known as mitigated echolalia. Now, when I think of the word mitigated, it's kind of an odd verb for me. I instead like to say, think of edited. That's the way I think of it, edited echolalia. So in some way, the child's gonna edit the echolalia. So maybe the child makes the phrase shorter. Maybe the child, instead of saying, turn it to the next page, the child says, turn it, and I turn it, he says, to the next page, or maybe the child shortens it, and the child says, turn it to the next, or maybe the child pauses, or maybe the child, so there's a lot of different things the child can do with it. Maybe the child combines it with another script. Turn it to the next page. Good job, Jack, in which she's combining two different gestalts. So what you see is there's some editing going on here, where in the stage one, it was a verbatim repetition. In stage two, it becomes edited in some way. Now we're gonna look at stage three. In stage three, the child's going to take those gestalts and the child's going to break them down into single words and then combine those single words. So now the child is beginning to generate language all by him or herself. So instead of saying, turn it to the next page, good job, Jack, the child might say, turn page, turn page. 
the child is taking down those scripts, those gestalts of language into single words and then combining them. Or they might say, instead of turn page, they might say, they might say, um, good Jack, good Jack. So they're changing it and they're taking those gestalts, breaking them down into single words and combining them. That's known as stage three, mitigation of single words. Now we're gonna get into the sentence level when we go into stage four, five, and six for Blanc's natural language acquisition. So stage four in Blanc's natural language acquisition would be creating a very simple sentence. Now this sentence could either be grammatically correct or grammatically incorrect. But what the child is doing is pretty much a subject, verb, object kind of simple sentence. So for instance, for turning the page, the child could say instead, Jack turn page, Jack turn page. So the child is now creating a very, very simple grammatical sentence. That's stage four. In stage five, things are going to start getting complex. In stage five, this is more of what you're going to see with the typically developing five-year-old. In stage five, you're going to start to see clauses combined to form sentences. So stage five is referred to generation of sentences with advanced grammar. And what we're going to see is compound sentences. So perhaps the child is saying, I turn the page and you turn the page, a compound sentence. You're gonna see complex sentence. Perhaps the child says, I turn the page because I love books, a nice complex sentence. Perhaps you're going to see an ex expanded sentence. I turn the page and, and now we're at the end. I turn the page. So we're getting, we're getting into more complex sentences with more clauses. I think a better example of that would be saying, I turn the page on the table. Okay, so they're adding a prepositional phrase at the end. Now we're going to go into the last level, level six. Level six is complex. That is known as all sentence grammar. So this is when we're going to get into the auxiliaries are being reversed. So we're going to say instead of, instead of you have seen something, you're going to say, have, have you seen this book before? So we're putting have first. We're reversing the auxiliary verb. So things are getting a lot more complex. Another example is passive sentences. So maybe you are going to say, we're turning the book still, we're still using this. This book was made by an author and by an illustrator. So we're using a passive voice, okay? Perhaps you're going to see even a more complex sentence in which we're having something such as a how-to it, um, you were going to have different, excuse me, subject and verbs. So you can say, I'm going to teach you now how to read the book, the child might say. So we're having different subjects and verbs acting on objects within one sentence. So this is the most complex form of sentences there are, which is stage six. And that's the final stage, okay? So you might also see some gerunds. So you might say, I like to read when I go home. So you're saying, I like to, or I like to, I'm sorry, I like to practice reading when I go home. So we're going to see some um, the ing verbs used as a gerund. So we have a lot of complexity there at stage six. And this is something that doesn't develop into school age up to age seven years of age. So that would be the final stage, stage six. And this is a lot of information, stage one through stage six. I'm going to briefly summarize it for you. Stage one, echolalia. Stage two, mitigated echolalia or edited echolalia. Stage three, mitigation of single words, where you're taking single words from the gestalt and combining them into two word phrases. Stage three, simple sentences, which can be grammatically correct 
or incorrect, that's stage four, excuse me. Stage five is going to be sentences that are more advanced in grammar, such as compound sentences, complex sentences. Then we're going to go in expanded sentences with prepositional phrases. Then we're going to go into stage six, in which we're starting to really have the most complex syntax and grammar in our language. It covers all sentences. And that's when we get into passive voice. And that's when we get into reversing the auxiliary into the beginning of the sentences to, to begin the sentences. And that's where we're getting into combining different subject and verb actions within a single sentence. For instance, I am going to show you how to read the book. So things are getting very complex there. And those stages, that last stage, stage six, really doesn't develop until about seven years of age. So that's going beyond preschool. So what do we do with all of that information? What Marge Blanc recommends is when you look at their utterances in a language sample, with every single utterance, you assign it a stage. So if the child is giving you an echolalia uh, phrase, such as I said, turn it to the next page, that you would write stage one. When the child, for instance, in a stage two says, and the next time, turn, turn it, turn, and then I, he pauses, next page, that would be a stage two, which the child is editing the gestalt by adding a pause. Stage three, once again, if you see a third utterance, for instance, and then the child is beginning to say, turn page, in which the child is forming their own utterance by combining words, that would be a stage three. So every single utterance in the language sample, if you have 50 utterances in the language sample, you would assign a stage number two. After you assign that stage number, you look at what are the percentages of utterances. So if 80% of the utterances are stage one out of the 50 utterances, then you would say this child is developmentally at stage one. If 80% of the utterances were stage two, this child is developmentally at stage two and for, so forth, three, four, five, and six. But you can think about that and think, well, how many children are really going to be 80% at one single stage? Most children have a variety of sentences that are at different stages. So in that case, you're going to say, are there any stages that 50% or more of the time the child is at that stage? Perhaps 50% of the utterances are at stage three in which the child is combining words. If that were the case, you would say that a majority of the time the child is functioning at a stage three phrase, phase. Excuse me. So what about if there is no 50% and everything is pretty much evenly split across phases? 25% of the time there's stage one, 25 stage twos, 25 stage three, and 25% of the time you're seeing stage four. In that case, you're going to say that the child is communicating across stages. What Marge Block recommends in her book is that then you would say that the child is moving towards the highest stage. So suppose 25% of the utterances are at stage four, and 25% are at stage three, and 25% are at stage two, and 25% are at stage one. If that were the case, you would say that the child is moving towards the highest stage, which is stage four when all things are equal. So that is how you take the stages and you analyze the stages. So what does this information tell us? It tells us, as her book would say, it tells us what the journey is from echolalia to self-generated language. How much of the language is echolalia, how much of the language is self-generated, and where are we? And she recommends every three to four months to take a language sample and look at the journey. Now, I must say my own personal opinion is that I prefer to use, as I mentioned in the last episode, IRS, and that would be intra-repetitive speech. So intra-repetitive speech is how many times in the utterance, what percentage of the time does the child repeat him or herself 
verbatim. So that is a way of monitoring gestalt speech to self-generated speech. The more the child repeats him or herself, the more the speech is echolalic. The less the child repeats him or herself, the more the speech is self-generated. The reason I like IRS, percent of intra repetitive speech is because it's objective. So if I am saying this child is, is producing echolalic speech because the child is saying what I just said, maybe the child is saying what I just said because that's the appropriate thing to say in the context. So that is a real weakness I see of the natural language acquisition approach is that it's highly subjective. It's highly based on what I perceive. If I perceive it to be echolalic speech because I said it, then I'm going to mark it as a one. But maybe it was self-generated speech in which the child was thinking the same thing I did within the activity. Maybe I'll mark it as a one because I think you're saying that because it's based off of a favorite show of yours. But maybe the child's making that comment because it is indeed self-generated speech. So it's very perceptive. And I believe in evaluations, the best thing to do is to have a blank slate and to look at the evaluation as objectively as possible. Look at the child's language as objectively as possible. I don't think it's fair to look at children's language through the eyes of this is a child with autism. I think it's more fair to look at a language script as a blank slate and to say this child is verbatim repeating his own speech, despite the fact that my behavior is changing and despite the fact that the context is changing. That makes it very clear that it is not self-generated because it no longer matches the communication partner's behavior or the activity, the environment at hand. That to me is fair. That to me is objective. I mean, we've all been there before in which perhaps we've had a viewpoint and we've been judged because this, when someone said, well, you think this way because you're of this gender or you think this way because you're of this political party or this occupation or of this geographic region. And it's like, no, I think this way because I looked at the research and this is what I came up with. I did my own research. I did my own studies. I think that when we evaluate each other or even when we evaluate our communication, our speech, our language, any evaluation done as, any evaluation for that matter, should be done as objectively as possible. So I think that when we start making judgments over whether an utterance is echolalic, mitigated echolalia, or is this uh, um, echolalia single word combination, the more we put our perception into it, the more subjective it is, the less reliable it is, the less valid it is. And I think that everyone deserves a blank slate and everyone should be judged based on their behavior at that moment, based on the language sample that they give you, not considering their past history, not considering their diagnosis. Just look at what they give you and then you're going to make the most objective, valid and reliable assessment possible. So that was my opinion, and that's why I prefer to look at intra-repetitive speech. Do I see value in looking at these six stages? Of course. Think about it. Language is a container of thought. The fact that we have these words for these six stages means that we're better able to identify them and discuss them with one another. If we just called it all echolalia, we couldn't discuss the stages of development that we see. We couldn't discuss regression or progression. 
So this is very, very nice. And there's a lot of great value in natural language acquisition and a lot of great value in defining each of the steps so that we can more clearly see it. It's more like seeing variations of the color of yellow. There's lime and there's lemon and there, no, not really lime. There's lemon and there's oatmeal and there's, there's different colors. And when you have those names, you're more apt to see the differences and therefore more apt to see progression or regression. So there is value in qualitatively defining each of these stages, but we have to be very careful with assessment that we're being objective. So I'm gonna stick with it from my two cents, the intra-repetitive speech, the percentage of utterances that are verbatim that the child is repeating him or her self is how I can look at the gestalt to self-generative development. Okay, so please take all of the information we just discussed and roll up your sleeves and go make the world a better place, one child at a time.